everyone, Tardis Guy 123 here, and today I am reviewing Inferno, the classic third Doctor story from right at the start of his era and the end of his first series back in 1970. Um, so let's just take a look right here. We've got BBC DVD Doctor Who Inferno. This is the special edition version, by the way. I'll just flip that forward so you can see it a bit better. You've got the third Doctor right there and got a um, primary, Primord, um, I believe is what they're called. They're not actually named in the story, but they are in the credits. And they're sort of like the token monster of the story. And there you have the Brigade leader, or who is basically the Brigadier's alternative self. And you sort of like got the Earth erupting in a ball of um, fire and lava in the background there. So quite a nice cover you've got going on. And down there you got the John Pertwee years 1970 to 74, two disc set. Here is the side with simply Inferno written there, and you've got BBC DVD. And if you do flip the um, cover over, so that it's got the new BBC logo, it will also have um, special edition written under it. So if you prefer that, then you can do that. Actually, it comes like that. I flipped over here, so this is the alternative cover rather than the original, but anyway, it's starring John Pertwee by Don Hewton, who only went on to write one more, actually, The Mind of Evil, which I really want to get, but I'm saving it till last, because I want to um, have, sort of, like, a good one to go out on with John Pertwee, so I'm saving it to be my last John Pertwee story, so hopefully it lives up to that hype, and there you have um, commentary, and then Can You Hear the Earth Scream, which is the making of documentary, which is quite a nice little making of documentary. Haydoke versus Havoc, which is um, Toby Haydoke uh, bringing, uh, bringing back the old, um, the surviving members of the Havoc, Havoc team. And if you don't know who um, Havoc are, they're sort of like the guys who um, did a lot of the stunts for the third Doctor era. They're sort of like this group of stuntmen, really. And um, yeah, that's who they are, and it's quite a fun documentary. If you like um, Toby Haydoke's other stuff, then you will probably really enjoy that one. Doctor Forever Lost in the Dark Dimension. It's been quite a while since I um, saw that one, but I think that's all I... Um, Doctor Forever is basically about the gap between um, the 1989 when Doctor Who ended and 2005 when it came back. And yeah, that's basically what that's about. It's not the um, YouTuber, and if you haven't checked out Dr. Forever, I suggest you do. He does wonderful videos there. Uh, but anyway, then there's the Unit Family Part 1, which is sort of like a look at, well, the Unit Family, really. And this sort of like goes through from the start with the Web of Fear, um, the Invasion, then it goes on to the whole of Series 7, ending off with this story in Inferno, and then I think parts two and three take a look at the rest of those eras. So yeah, that's that. Uh, visual effects, promo film, deleted scene, and some other stuff as well on there. So that's all well and good. Opening this up now, and so we can have a look at the inside. There you have um, the booklet, disc one with just the third Doctor on it, and disc two with the Brigade Leader and the Primord, Primord, I hope I'm saying that right. And now let's take the booklet out, just have a quick look at that. A whopping seven parts on this, because that's sort of like the standard for um, 1970 at least. And this is actually the last seven parter, so yeah, it might be a little bit interesting. Um, Inferno, and they have all the special features once again and there's one last look at that so now for my thoughts on this well I suppose you can call it a classic really and it really is deserving of that um, name classic it's sort of like a word that gets thrown about a lot when it comes to Doctor Who uh, but this one really is something that deserves the name classic because it's such a great idea behind it. It sort of like really does fit that gritty style that season seven was going for. And so it sort of like sums it up in a lot of ways. And you got this sort of like 
um, wonderful location shoots with sort of like this desert landscape and whatnot. And the music matches wonderfully with that, with sort of like eerie sounds and whatnot, and it all works out very nicely for that. And just creates an atmos this bleak atmosphere that really does fit this story because it's sort of like, well, it's the end of the world, or at least the alternative world, um, where you go sort of like, you've got parts one and two sort of like setting up what the inferno is all about, what that project is, and everything, and then you sort of like skip forward to. Uh, not skip forward, sorry, skip over to the alternative world where the Doctor goes. And so like, he doesn't exist there, so you've got this very interesting thing where you get to see um, the characters you usually know and love playing the good guys, but instead playing the bad guys, so that's where the brigade leader comes in and whatnot, and it's all very interesting right there. And you've also got Liz Shaw playing, um, I've forgotten the rank or whatever it is, sort of like, um, I know Benton's is now Platoon Underleader, which is a bit of a mouthful, as the Doctor says. So that's all wonderful. It's nice to see all that stuff going along there. And then for the um, other characters in this, there are quite a wealth of characters. And because it's a seven-parter, you really can build up those characters a great deal. And, you know, that's a lot of fun. So you've got characters like um, Greg Sutton, who's sort of like the action hero type character. In a lot of ways, it sort of like helps out the Doctor. And, you know, it's probably the mo the one with the strongest moral sense in the alternative universe. And the only reason he's still alive is because of his usefulness um, and his experience. So as soon as that runs out, he's basically had it in a lot of ways because of his insolence, I guess. Whereas in the um, other universe, he is still basically the same character. He probably... Um, the actor basically plays the same character in both, whereas some of the other actors, say Nicholas Courtney, gets to do something very different. He basically does the same thing. Same with um, Professor Starman. He gets to be sort of like the villain in both sides, although he gets to be even more villainous in the alternative universe where he's sort of like allowed to shoot people even. And you kind of like think that probably the, um, alter that the normal universe Starman probably has that in him as well. And actually, he actually plays Starman, Olaf Pooley, unfortunately passed away earlier this year, but he was well over 100, so he had a good long life. And, yeah, I think he's one of the only people to be involved in Doctor Who to live over 100 years. So, yeah, there's a little um, bit of trivia for you. But yeah, that was all just very, um, that character was a very good character, and you feel the actor really did do a good job. Um, with that, especially sort of like the moments of not absent mindedness, I'm trying to think, where he sort of like has those attacks, and you know, the music matches that very well as well. And that's sort of like in the um, latter half of the story where they're trying to persuade him to slow down drilling, but he won't have anything because he's sort of like under the influence of the ooze and whatnot. And the ooze itself is sort of like the main, well, I guess, monster of the story, or it creates the monster of the story more accurately. But it's all like the problem that's going on here. It's the cause of everything that's happening. Because sort of like people touch it and then they turn into these savage creatures, which is quite interesting. Um, and they are the primoids right there. I, I keep forgetting. Is it primords? Primoids? Primords? I do not know. Uh, presumably, I probably should know, but I don't. But anyway. Talking about Nicholas Courtney himself more in this. Obviously he's got the eye patch on to distinguish himself. And that works out very nicely for his character in a lot of ways. It sort of like adds to that alternative universe character. And he's very much is a villain in this. And also a bit of a bully as well. He's sort of like um, a bully character. And he's sort of like when he's backed up by his thugs. You can see him being very um, angry and whatnot. And there are some wonderful moments with him. And then once the thugs are gone, he's sort of like left on his own, he's trying to get the Doctor to take them, you sort of like see the more inner coward come out where he's a bit more um, terrified of what's going on and that's very nice. And then when I was saying about wonderful moments, there are quite a lot, especially with his character, and there's sort of like the one um, where John Pertwee does this very nicely too, where he says he doesn't exist in their world, and he says that line wonderfully, and then um, Nicholas Courtney just looks up at him and says, then you won't feel the bullets when we shoot you. That's a wonderful, like, such a cold line, and it's just wonderfully 
um, delivered by Nicholas Courtney. I think that is one of the standout moments of the story. It's one of the things that really does stick in your head after you finish watching this. And then for Liz Shaw, who sort of plays a baddie, maybe not as much. She, she plays a more interesting character than her um, normal um, version because she sort of like got that darker streak in her. But the Doctor sort of like brings out the good in her. And by the end of the story, she does help him to escape and save um, the other world. So that was all. Um, so that's very good for her character. I think um, Caroline, Caroline John who is sadly no longer with everyone involved in this story seems to be no longer with us, quite a few people are. I think Terence Stix is still with us, along with a couple of others. Um, but quite a bit of the cast have sadly passed away. You know, John Pertwee, of course, Nicholas Courtney as well. Um, but yeah, they do do a wonderful job in this story. As I was saying about Caroline John, she does do wonderfully with that character. And then it's all like, it all builds up to the end of the world pretty much happens in um, episode 6 and you know once you've reached Penetration Zero you just have that constant sound going on in the background of just the world ending and erupting in flame in the background and it's just wonderfully done that and then before that you've got the constant sound of the drilling which you know both those things help to add tension all the way through the story and it really does build up and up and up until you get to the um, cliffhanger part six which is a wonderful cliffhanger where you sort of like got the um lava and whatnot and everything rushing towards the hut and you know those characters ultimately don't make it it's just the doctor who manages to escape and then you go into episode seven and this is where it does unfortunately begin to go a bit downhill now it's not bad at all it's just a bit of an anticlimax and it is rather unavoidable because, I mean, obviously, you've just destroyed a world. How are you going to follow up from that? Because, you know, the Doctor's got to save the day. And, you know, he he does. So you sort of, like, get a bit of a low-key end to the story. And I feel maybe something could have been done to get, add the tension to that. I don't know. But, unfortunately, that's the way it ended up. But it's still a solid end to the episode. It's just not as good as everything that came before and built up to that yeah, you still get a lot of enjoyment out of everything that goes before that with just constant build up of tension and whatnot. That's all very nicely done. And yeah, I think overall it obviously is a wonderful piece of television. And yeah, having the alternative universe aspect, which oddly enough was thrown in um at the what's it called not originally not it wasn't in the original brief, it's sort of like float thrown in to help it reach seven parts because it felt the original story wouldn't be able to last seven parts and you know oddly enough despite it being a backup it is the thing that people most remember about this story is the classic side of this story the idea that um you know you've got these alternative universe aspects and yet it's odd to think of this story without that and it probably is it helps to rack up the tension a lot more and just helps to do wonders with this story and is as I say, the reason it is most well remembered. So that is my thoughts on this, and I think you all have guessed it by now. It's not a 10 out of 10. It's the third 10, 10 out of 10 in a row now. I gave it to The City of Death and The Reign of Terror, and now to Inferno. Um, so, yeah, that is um, my thoughts on Inferno. Next um, DVD review will be. Uh, the Cyber Tales box actually, which contains Silver Nemesis and Revenge of the Cybermen. Um, don't expect any, any more 10 out of 10s there, but anyway, those are my thoughts on Inferno. Thank you all for watching everyone, and I will see you all next time. Bye everyone.